happy to be joined by RSL defender Tony Beltran. Tony, thanks for popping in. Tell us about the bye week and how bizarre that is, maybe having that come in in only week three of the season. It was very strange. It was a little disappointing for me and all the guys. Um, you know, early Aaron. on in the season, we like to get things going, get a rhythm, and, you know, especially early on in those, with those games. And to have a, have a bye this early, it's very disruptive. And, um, but, you know, with the schedule, it is what it is. We, we put the work in on the field with the bye week, and, you know, we got two weeks of training, and obviously there were things, there were kinks that needed to be ironed out after our last game against Philly. And so it was an opportunity to focus on that and focus on developing the new formation tactically and, and, uh, and also a little bit of rest because we'll need that in the summer um, when games come uh, pretty quickly. You know, Tony, coming into the season, it, a couple years ago it was losing uh, Fabian, um, it was losing Will Johnson, it was losing Homison. This year, a little bit different. You bring back Homison, but you lose winger, uh, Grabovoy, Sebastian, Carlos, Robbie, um, Nat. That, those are significant voices inside the locker room. How, how, does, how does that locker room absorb that type of loss with that type of kind of experience in Major League Soccer? Because I, I would imagine by losing some, you gain some new voices that have the opportunity to step up, have the opportunity to become leaders like yourself, Chris Schuler, be a little bit louder. Um, whereas it was kind of, it, it always seemed like it was this kind of shared responsibility uh, inside of that culture that you guys have built. Yeah, absolutely. That's the exciting part about it. You see sort of these um, guys that were in between, the younger guys that are you know, not so young anymore, like myself and Schuler. Um, having to take a step forward within the role, within the locker room and on the field as well. And the guys behind us, you see a lot of opportunity for the young guys, so it's exciting for them. Obviously, um, you know, very sad to see all those teammates go. And I remember the first couple of weeks, you know, walking into the training room or the locker room, I was still half expecting all of them to, to come in at some point, and it was very strange when they not. I remember Beckerman made a comment at one point saying that he felt like those guys were on vacation and they needed to get back to preseason. But that's part of pro sports. And, um, you know, we brought in some very capable guys. You gave the example of Homison, and I think uh, there's going to be a little bit of a transition period, especially considering that we're trying to implement a new formation, but it's an exciting time for RSL. We have some great veteran guys, and we have some really, really exciting young guys who I think are ready to take the step forward. Let's talk about that formation, because you know the diamond formation that Jason and, and Jeff and everyone built, the coaching staff built, was based on the players that you guys had available. And with the expansion draft and the trades and allocation money and everything kind of going each and every way. I think Jeff, what he recognized very quickly was between Plata, uh, Sebastian Jaime, Olmes Garcia, Jordan Allen, you guys have a lot of talent up front. And having kind of that three-prong attack changes the dynamic of the group. You allow Luis Gill to get in a more central situation this year with DeMar a little bit higher, you're a little bit higher. How do you see kind of the formation um, as, a, as an outside back, where your role is uh, uh, kind of overlapping, getting forward, and where that freedom lies for you to kind of handle your responsibilities defensively and then know when you can step into the attack. Yeah, I think that was a big problem for Jeff um, towards the end of last year was how do I get all these guys in the field? Because we have so many weapons and, you know, only so many spots, of course, in the attacking end. And this new formation suits us because we can get, there's more opportunity for guys um, to get in dangerous situations. You know, you have obviously have Javi in the middle still pulling the strings, but you have Sabo up top and then you have you know, Plata, when he comes back at Olmos, is doing a tremendous job, and Seba on the right side right now. So I think uh, from that aspect, the formation it was needed because you give those guys the opportunity to be higher up the field and combine and do what they do. For me, it's a little bit more of an opportunity to, to be aggressive because previously in the diamond, Kyle would often be isolated when we were in the attack, and I would have to stay home, or one of the outside backs would have to play very conservatively, because if the ball turns over, you know, it's just him in the middle of the field. Now, with Luis kind of playing next to him in that linking midfield role, it gives us an opportunity to be a little more cavalier in the attack and take some more risks, because there's someone there helping Kyle. Yeah, you talked about Homison coming back. We always joke around, it, it, and I've always said this. You know when Homison really wants to start running? It's when he peeks his head out like a little turtle, and then you know he's going to take off. Because yep. the rest of the time, he's just in cruise control. He's so big, so strong, so fast. What, what's it like for you, just knowing that you've got this guy who tactically is much, much different than Nat Borches was, but at the same time, athletically, he can make up for mistakes in ways that I mean, I go back to that run where he caught Wayne Rooney in the All-Star game at yep. Red Bull Arena a few years ago. 
there's, I, I don't think there's another player physically that's built like him in terms of a center back in Major League Soccer. No, Major League Soccer, and I'm trying to think of you know, right now players around the world that play like that. There really is no other one of the like. And I have to be honest, I've only seen Hobson sprint a handful of times, and I've played <laughs> with him probably 100 games, which is pretty incredible. I feel like all I do is sprint nonstop, and he's just in third gear the whole time. But, you know, he can get away with it because he is that. He is a phenom athletically and um, obviously a very different player than Nat. Nat was more calculated and pragmatic in the way he played. And, you know, he was a student of the game. And so he was always positionally in the right spots. Whereas Homison can be a little bit more bold in the way he defends because he knows he can turn it on and chase defenders down. And it's, it's certainly exciting to watch. And it's, uh, it's a luxury to play next to. To play next to both of them is a luxury. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's good to have him back. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll steal some more time from these guys. I mean, you, you think one of the, the subtle tweaks in this formation is having Luis Gill stepping into a starting role, whereas last year trying to find him the right spots, <clears throat> trying to figure out how he's kind of a number 10, but Javier is so consistent and, and so dynamic in his approach to the game while he simplifies the game for everybody else. How has he slid in centrally in that dynamic of having Javi and Luis and Kyle all playing in a, in a very familiar role but it's kind of a weird teeter-totter balance of who stays, who goes, where's the second run, and how they kind of combine in those short little triangles. Yeah, it is. But I think that's why uh, having pre- previously played the diamond helps because a lot of times in that formation, when guys, you know, the outside diamond would go, we would kind of shift around. Or if Beckerman would get forward, someone would have to shift back into that spot. So those guys are, you know, pretty used to, uh, to that kind of mindset. And it's a big year for Luis. Uh, he's an incredibly capable young man, incredibly dedicated young man. He's, I mean, he's, he's going to have a breakout season sooner or later. I mean, he pretty much already has a couple years ago. So I'm really excited about the possibility of those three playing together consistently for a whole year. I mean, if I were in practice and those three were on the other team, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't want to play in that short-sighted game. So it's pretty exciting to have them all together there, and I think Luis is going to do well, especially with those two older guys next to him. Um, you know, telling him the right things. Tony, talk a little bit about what having the Real Monarchs here means for the younger group. And, I mean, you've been a pretty consistent starter since you came into the league back in in 08. So your situation was different than maybe, let's say, Chris Schuler's. If he had had the opportunity to get an extra 25 or 30 games when he was kind of learning under Nat and Homison back in his first couple years out of Creighton, I mean, we think the world of him now. We think, oh, my God, if he had had that kind of development opportunity. So just based on what you've seen in a very short period of time with the Monarchs existing under the RSL umbrella, talk about from a player perspective the opportunities that these kids have. The opportunity is huge. Uh, there's no denying it. It's, it's absolutely huge. Um, this is something Schuler and I talked about a lot in preseason because, you know, we're rooming together and we're going out and training every day with these young kids. And for 17, 18, they are hands down incredible. I mean, it's an exciting time now for RSL, but I think five, six years from now is going to be very, very exciting mm-hmm. if we can keep these guys together because they're tremendously talented. To be completely honest, they do things at 17 that, you know, I wasn't able to do. They see the game faster. They see the game in a way that I didn't develop until later because I hadn't had those games under my belt. And so now having them play with the Monarchs and the fact that they're going to get 20 plus games a year, it's huge. They're going to develop quicker. They're going to be able to stay in the system longer. Um, whereas before they just kind of caught in this practice player situation. It's, it's very hard to do when you don't feel like you're playing towards something throughout an entire 10 month season. So it's, uh, I think it's fantastic that the Monarchs are here and it's going to be great for those guys. You know, it was, I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday there was a story in Major League Soccer that I found very, very interesting. Being a Project 40 guy coming out of Cal State Fullerton when getting 24 grand was way more than money playing soccer than I ever thought I would get and pushing aside school and saying, okay, I'll go back at some point. Um, Now you've got LA Galaxy 2 signing a kid who went to UC Santa Barbara this last year, came out of college. They provide him financial aid to go to school. So now he goes to Cal State Dominguez on where this basically across the parking lot Mm. from StubHub Center. And he's given up a college scholarship at UCSB to get 50 games as opposed to only getting 20 games. And I think that's kind of the twist is now you're going to see USL Pro having the opportunity, uh, the respective clubs, putting a little bit more of financial aid out there to say, okay, we'll put you in this professional environment. You may not be an LA Galaxy player, but as of right now, you can play for the LA Galaxy too. 
train like a pro, get games like a pro, and you'll still get that financial aid component to go back to college. And that, that kind of twists the way, you know, for me, that was mom, dad, listen, I can go back to school, but mm -hmm. I can play soccer. Now you start thinking about from an MLS level to a, you know, USL pro, AAA situation, that kind of changes the, the dynamic of what this next five years could look like now that we're starting to see each individual club starting to rally around that idea of having a quote-unquote second team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was the same way for me when I came in, Dunny. That was the biggest selling point for my parents is, you know, I'm going to have that ability to go back to school and finish my college education because it's a hard thing to ask a kid to walk away from. Um, but, you know, you're right. The leak has come so far in the short eight years that I've been here. Uh, just leaps and bounds. And this system's developing, and it's going to keep developing rapidly. And these kids are going to keep getting better and better, and I think they're going to be coming out earlier and earlier because of the opportunities there. So... Really exciting times for MLS moving forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll put you under a little bit of pressure just because there's everyone here. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've got, you've got a lot more eyes on you. I think heading into last year, and you've got the changeover from Jason leaving, going to New York City FC. Uh, you've got, at the time, CJ leaving and going to Chicago, which now he's joined up. Miles gone. Jeff takes over. You've got a whole new coaching staff. Um, you, quote unquote the diamond you guys still are incredibly successful wins consistency points playoffs but how has Jeff kind of changed this year as he implements his ideas his vision his style his formation um, with a lot less I, I would say personalities inside the locker room in, in terms of like the established guys how, how, is, how have you seen him evolve as an assistant to a head coach to now putting his stamp on this group with a different look yeah, I think you said it. He's starting to put his stamp on the on this group. I think before it was a situation where he came in and there wasn't a lot of adjustments that needed to be made. Yeah. You know, we were well a machine and we just kept on running. And, um, you know, I'm sure if he would have held the status quo, we would have been, you know, same successful team this year. We would have made the playoffs, of course. But he's, he has a vision and this is his vision. And he wants RSL to play this way because he believes this is how we're going to be most successful. And, you know, you see that there and you see that every day when he's coming into the locker room and hanging out with the guys. He's, you know, obviously still the same self and he's the man. And, and you see that in trainings, you know, how he shifts away from old drills that we used to do all the time. And now he's starting to implement new drills and things like that and just trying to change the way we work a little bit and the way we think. And, um, and he's doing a fantastic job. I mean, Jeff is the kind of guy I want to do well so that he does well. You know, he's just someone that, that you that you generally like. He's a, he's a very good guy, and he wants to, he has all of our best interests in hand, and I want him to succeed. So, very cool. Yeah. RSL defender Tony Beltran with us for a couple more minutes here on ESPN 700 on frame. I'm sorry to cut you off, Matt. Um, Tony, it's always curious to me how the locker room breaks down kind of a season. I mean, we joke about the MLS season being interminable and being a 13-month season per year, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually only 10 and a half months. I remember <laughs> the year we went to MLS Cup. It was literally January 25th to December 7th. Yep. So this year, you've got 34 games. You've got a loaded Western Conference with Houston, Kansas City coming over. You've got Open Cup, you know, which we'll find out about in May. We've got the CONCACAF draw, which we'll find out about in May for games in the fall. How do you compartmentalize or prepare is it a week by week thing do you do you look at months do you look at quarters i mean every player and coach kind of has a different perspective i'm just curious as to your approach week to week for me personally it's week to week focus on this week of training you know preparing my body preparing myself physically and mentally for the team that we're playing against for the opponent that i'm playing against who's going to be the left winger you know for toronto this week or you know san jose the week after you can't look too far ahead, and I don't like to look at the schedule that much right now because mm -hmm. it is such a long season, and it's it's going to be a dogfight this year in the West. You know, it always was previously, but now you have Houston and Casey coming in, and it's going to be an absolute dogfight because the level is just so high. Any team could, you know, should make the playoffs, and really any team could have an argument to make a run for the MLS Cup. So if I start looking ahead to the summer, that's just going to exhaust me. I'm going to start sweating right now <laughs> because, you know, some of those summer games, right. it's, it can get pretty tough and taxing on your body. But you, you get through it, and, and we talk about it being long now, and then before I know it, I'll be sitting here, and it's October, and we'll be getting ready for the playoffs. The season always seems to fly by. So one week at a time, that's the way I take it. Is, is that something you had from the beginning, or did it take a while to get to the point where you figured out, like, I, I've got to compartmentalize this a little better? Yeah, I, th I think it's something you develop over time. Um, you know, fortunately, I had good guys like, you know, like Nat, Robbie Russell, Nick, Bex, 
to kind of show me the ropes and okay, you know, calm down. This is how this is how things work during the season. You know, yeah. um, here's what a pro day is. Here, yes, yeah. Here's what a pro day is. You know, you don't have aches and pains yet, but you will definitely go stretch after practice. Go take an ice bath. Um, so yeah, I didn't see that right away. You know, when you're young, you got big eyes. And I remember I came in, I just wanted to run nonstop and kick balls nonstop and work out ten hours a day, but. You know, that's, that's not realistic. That's not how it works. So it's, it's something you develop over time. And it's kind of, uh, I noticed it for the first time this preseason, um, the younger guys asking me questions that not too long ago I was asking, you know, the older guys. And so it's, uh, it's kind of fun to be on the other hand of that. It's flattering. So I, I have a question for you that's kind of random and off topic. But you, you were talking about eight years ago, and you think about it doesn't seem like eight years you've been a part of this group. Mm-hmm. And I mean that in a positive way. But you came in at a time where kind of social media was just starting. It was, it was this weird phase of like MySpace and Facebook transitioning. Mm-hmm. Now you've got Twitter and, and all the different forums. We've got Instagram. Like back in the day, it used to be Big Soccer, and you'd hope not to get slaughtered on Big Soccer. Yep. And that was that. a positive. And you're like, yes, yeah. I had a good game. I didn't get demolished. <laughs> but now you turn on your phone, and you're real, uh, how you handle social media has always been, I've been impressed with because it's always positive. Uh, you show your life, you show behind the curtain, but at the same time, you know, it, it's, it's always a positive message. You never get caught up in kind of the go, go between. As you see kind of these younger kids come through, and, and we saw it last year after the end of the season, there was mm-hmm. a specific player that kind of got himself in trouble retweeting and tweeting stuff and going out there and, and not being so nice of, to his teammates. But how, how do you guys find that balance of knowing that when you come back to the locker room, you turn on your phone, if you've had a tough game, you don't want to look at social media. You know, if you had a good game, you know, maybe you open it up and you say something positive. How, how do you as an athlete kind of find that, that balance and that, this weird dynamic that we're in? It's tough, um, you know, because af- as athletes, we're very emotional. You know, and we're controlled by our emotions. We're super competitive. And, and so, you know, like you said, a lot of times after games or after tough practice or if things don't go your way, you want to vent. You know, you're yep. ticked off and it's very easy to pick up your phone and, you know, put something on there for people to see to get your, to get your voice heard. Yep. But you, you got to learn quickly not to do that. That's, you know, personally, in my opinion, that's not the intelligent way to go about things. So hopefully, you hope that these guys will learn that early on. You know, everybody's young. I did a lot of dumb things when I was in my early 20s. I mean, I still do a lot of dumb things now, but you learn by mistakes. My dad's a big believer in that. And so, you know, hopefully these guys, you know, have one or two hiccups, nothing too serious. And then, and then you learn from it because social media is forever. And, you know, that stuff doesn't go away. And fortunately now, too, as this as social media becomes bigger and bigger, the MLS is investing in having social media experts come out every preseason and coach the younger guys and coach the older guys um, on how to deal with this stuff, what to say on Twitter, what not to say on Twitter, what to post on Instagram, what not to do. And, you know, a lot of it seems like common sense, but, um, you know, the phone is... I don't know. It's it's just so easy. Yeah, so uh, it is. you know, but it is forever. The internet is forever. So um, so yeah, I, it's it's good that the league does that and they're putting focus on that because it's a cool tool. I like being able to connect with the fans and I like keeping things positive. And obviously, not everybody's going to be a fan of me. I understand that. I'm my own biggest critic, and I'm not holding out for universal popularity. But it's a really cool way to grow the club, grow the club, and to connect with the fans because we're nothing without them. Yeah, Tony, last question before we let you go and move on to Kurt Larson from Toronto. My question is about the fans. So when you go out for warm-ups and head up that tunnel and you can kind of feel that, that buzz in the stadium, especially now we're, we're literally, I think, 25 season tickets away from 15,000, which wow. was unconscionable. So I think get when, on it when we, out there. When we drafted you, right? Already. <laughs> um, those early days, you know, in Rice Eccles and then moving into the stadium and gaining permanence and gaining the identity mm-hmm. that we've had here. But to, to think that now Sunday could be 18th consecutive sellout, 20, I think it's 28 out of 34, something like that. Yeah. Just talk a little bit about that how you guys in the locker room kind of respond to that 12th man that, and that great home field advantage. This club has won 78% of home games since moving into Rio Tinto Stadium, which is an amazing figure. That's so cool, Trey. I'm, I'll never tire of talking about this. It's just so cool. It's just something to be so proud of. And, you know, it's, it's not the guys in the locker room. You know, of course, we're going out there trying to win and we're trying to make everybody proud of us. But it's really, it's, it's everybody in the club who's helped build this and it's, it's the fans because they've, they've developed this culture. And they've made Salt Lake City a soccer destination. And they've made Rio Tinto a soccer destination. And um, 
you know, it's just, it's such a great moment every year. You, you know, it's, it's a long off season and you miss that. You miss that feeling of walking out into the tunnel and feeling like you're home and feeling like your fans are behind you. And it's, it's, it's such a high. It's great. It's, it's, and you know, they provide that 12th man for us. They provide that little bit extra edge to give us that percentage, that 73% that you said. And, that, and that's incredible. That's something to be very proud of. And that's collectively just the soccer community and it's them. So always very grateful to them. And uh, it's always a pleasure to run out of that tunnel and, and hear the noise. All right. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks again for everything you've done to help uh, build this club up over the years. And uh, we look forward to seeing you out there on Sunday. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Pleasure. RSL hosts Toronto on March 29th at 5 o'clock. Get your tickets today.